Welcome to this recent edition of the AP World History Lecture Series. This week we'll be talking about Chapter 16 and the Two Worlds of Christendom. Um, one quick thing before we get into the slides regarding Christendom. Um, Christendom is a term you will hear as often to describe the world of Christianity. Think of the word Christendom as like mixing the word Christianity and kingdom a Christian kingdom. And as we look at this uh, set of slides, keep in mind the relationship not only between the organized Christian religion and the people it was meant to lead, but also the way Christianity was practiced throughout the world of Christendom. Obviously, there are two different worlds, so we're going to see two different interpretations. But also keep in mind the relationship between Christianity and how it parallels with the other religions we have seen during this period, and also see how it would often conflict with certain political authorities and the different approaches it takes from there. Okay, so without any further ado, the World Roundup. All right. So um, going into this, remember that the Western and Eastern Roman Empire is split into two. Um, the Western part was basically that headed by Rome. The Eastern part was that headed by Byzantium, which would eventually become Constantinople, which is today called Istanbul. Yes, there is a flame, uh, or sorry, not flame. There's a song associated with that. It, the song's a, a, a flamingly awesome song. Um, if that makes any sense. But nonetheless, um, it was split up by the Emperor Diocletian um, as a way to sort of keep the empire more manageable. However, as we well know, that the West eventually falls apart and the East remains intact. The East was a lot less susceptible to invasions and had a lot more money to basically solidify its people, whereas the Western part did not. And there, therefore, the West splits up. We have it split up into various kingdoms led by basically local people, local customs, local political authority. Um, for the most part, we have Ostrogoths um, in the regions of Italy and basically what is kind of sort of the beginnings of South East Europe. Um, we have the Visigoths ruling what is now Spain and Portugal, and the Franks ruling what is now France. That's where we get the name from. Angles and Saxon leading what is basically nowadays Britain. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that we didn't really have countries in Western Europe. This is basically just the types of people that lived there. They were oftentimes very disunified and just sort of living locally and doing their own thing. Um, but they were more or less descended from invading migrant people who came from kind of this sort of northeastern part of Europe and descended upon the rest of Europe um, as the Roman Empire began to sort of fall apart. Some contend that it wasn't so much an invasion as it was a gradual migration when you consider some of these invasions lasted hundreds of years. <coughs> Excuse me. So medieval Christendom, as I mentioned, was in two halves. You have your Germanic states over here and the Byzantine Empire over here. Um, both inherited Christianity from what used to be the more massive Roman Empire. Um, that Christian tradition remained intact. It never really went away and still isn't gone to this day from what is now essentially Europe. Western Europe especially. But after the 8th century, we see tensions between the two halves, and we'll see that tension in terms of the Christian interpretation grow and grow and grow till they eventually split. Spoiler alert. So, the successor states to the Roman Empire are the ones that I had mentioned there, but the issue that I have with it is that the term state is a little bit misleading, because these were not really states. They were more just territories occupied by people that kind of 
were described by historians as this. Um, the Ostrogoths did not necessarily consider themselves Ostrogoths. They considered some themselves whatever sort of tribe that they identified with. It's just sort of a thing that we've called them. But these weren't like states in the sense that they had a government and they collected taxes and they had, you know, armies with uniforms and that sort of thing that was not the case they barely even had cities cities kind of fell apart during this time so but these are sort of the territories where people lived after it byzantine empire yes that was that was a state there's pretty much no denying that but over here it's pretty stateless pretty delocalized pretty um de-urbanized and the place we're really looking at is this area of Constantinople, which had a huge advantage in terms of city building in that it was very conveniently located. To this day, Constantinople is one of the only cities that has the distinction of being on two continents. It's technically on both Asia and Europe, um, though today it is called Istanbul, but <coughs> it is um, the key hinge point between Black Sea trade and Mediterranean trade. So all of these rivers connect to various people living up here and all the goods can travel down here and get traded in the Black Sea and have to flow through Constantinople before they get to the Mediterranean. All the goods that come from the Mediterranean and the rest of the world via the Silk Roads have to go up through here through a straight series of straits called the Dardanelles up through the Bosporus Strait, which is where Constantinople is. So it's just a very key and conveniently located city because it's a very unique position in terms of trade. And that's what this slide really, really gets at. Um, it's on a area of the Bosporus known as the Golden Horn. Um, this is kind of the golden horn that it's talking about. A horn as in like something that comes out of a creature, not horn as in something you blow. Um, but commercially couldn't really have much of a better location. Um, and not only that, it's really difficult to attack um, because of its because of its kind of conveniently located area on um, on kind of this waterway. It's kind of hard to get at. It's a, it's a, it's a crush. You can really, really um, localize certain armies, which didn't mean it was totally unsusceptible to invasion. It does eventually fall to the Turks, which is basically the end of the Byzantine empire, which is truly the end of the Roman empire. But that kind of depends on who you talk to. Um, the Byzantines didn't really call themselves Byzantines. They thought of themselves as Roman. It's important to remember that sort of distinction. But one of the key early pieces of the relationship between politics and religion, in this case culture, is this idea of Cesaro papism. And a way to think of that is to think of, of Caesar over Pope. Okay. Caesar over papism. Okay. And basically the idea is the Caesar or emperor of the Byzantine empire has authority over the Pope. He appoints the Pope. He kind of tells the Pope what to do. Okay. In this case, we have the emperor Justinian sort of leading the papal court, if you will. Papal is something describing the Pope. And the emperor is the central figure and the Christian leader can't he can't claim any divinity. However, he can claim divine authority, which means he's basically God's agent on earth. At least that's what the the interpretation back then was. Um, however, the Caesar, the emperor, can basically tell people what to do, and he appoints the Pope, and the Pope is kind of a office of the emperor. And by doing that, that sort of completely solidifies the emperor's authority. And the emperor almost takes on this sort of religious element to him, but not completely because they believe in Christianity and there's only one God. So they can't really revert to sort of the um, the Roman sense where they had these sort of divinity cults surrounding them. They weren't able to do that, but they were as close as they could possibly get. And the way that they did that was a bunch of ways. One, they wore purple, um, which was a royal color back then. It was a very difficult color to find. It was a color only reserved for very, very wealthy people like the emperor. It's also the color of my guy Grimace and my other guy Prince. 
Prince is awesome, by the way. Um, but it was back then, not only for super cool mascots and <coughs> musicians, um, it was also for the most powerful people in the Byzantine Empire at the time. Also, if you were to see the Byzantine Emperor, you were supposed to bend below him and kiss his feet and kiss his hand, to basically very similar to the kowtow ritual that we saw in China. And engineers even went so far as to design certain mechanical devices that would sort of levitate the Emperor and like have him sort of seem larger than life when you saw him almost magical. If you were sort of some common person who would never witness that sort of thing ever in your life, you would not be that foolish to think of that as just a completely sort of miraculous um just thing like this person who's sort of a god even though they're not supposed to be god but they like to bend those rules quite often back then and that brings us to justin justinian and theodore they're kind of our famous byzantine emperors um though theodora was not quite an emperor but she was one of those ladies that was kind of the power behind the throne these are the people that usually you always associate with the byzantine empire interesting enough though they were both born to very modest backgrounds justinian was known as the sleepless emperor but he's actually born to a peasant family the way he got into power was his uncle was in the army and he rose through the ranks and justinian kind of latched on to a his uncle um, and his uncle basically was just a complete rock star in the military rose all the way to the top and eventually became the emperor um, eventually he dies and leaves it to his nephew Justinian who was educated within the royal court at that time Theodora is even more amazing she was actually born to circus performers her dad I believe was a bear tamer in a circus within Constantinople. Um, and she actually kind of follows the life of a performer and becomes an actress. Now, being an actress in plays back then usually meant you were also a prostitute. In fact, back then, actress and stripper were not that really different. It was kind of the same thing. You were kind of seen as that. And that was the life Theodora lived. However, she renounced that life. She moved to Alexandria and devoted herself to Christianity, then moved back to Constantinople and uh, became a weaver of wool and lived next to the um, palace of the emperor. Uh, while Justinian was sort of before he was emperor and his and his uncle was, um, Theodora caught his eye because apparently she was extraordinarily intelligent and beautiful and he just was infatuated with her and she became his mistress and eventually became his wife, even though that was highly looked down upon at the time because basically if you're a royal person, you're not supposed to marry a common woman, let alone somebody who used to be a prostitute slash actress. But it happened anyway, and they were able to build a whole lot of pretty ambitious construction programs for the Byzantine Empire. Um, and they're still widely regarded this day, regardless of their very, very humble upbringings. Um, there are two major achievements of one is the construction of the church of Hagia Sophia, which means holy wisdom. Um, it still stands to this day. It's one of the major tourist attractions. If you ever go to Istanbul, it's very striking and very, very impressive nonetheless. Um, and he also codified Roman law, yeah, and which is a big deal because now that it's written, it's a lot harder to manipulate the law. Um, it's a lot harder to basically make it up as you go along. And that was often the case. So definitely a, a big, big victory for sort of legal rights of people. It doesn't mean they were perfect, but they were better. <clears throat> And one of their major efforts was to try to reconquer the western part of the Roman Empire from the Germanic people who had taken it. Um, they kind of wanted to reestablish what the Roman Empire used to be. And in that regard, had they been successful, we would be talking about them in the same way that we talk about the Tang and Song dynasties in China, in which there's this period of sort of warring states where there is nobody in control, but then somebody retakes it and reestablishes the political state state that used to be. However, that didn't happen and honestly still hasn't happened to this day in Europe. A couple of people have tried, most notably this little Italian guy who fought for France named Napoleon and this crazy Austrian guy who led armies in Germany named Adolf Hitler. 
Both of them failed. But we also see the Byzantines tried way, way back in the 5th through 7th century, and they were not able to. Um, they actually did kind of retake Rome briefly, but they were never really able to keep control over it like the Romans did way, way back in the basically 3rd through 5th, 3rd century BCE to 5th century CE. Um, the Byzantines eventually abandoned Rome and tried to establish sort of a Western um, push into the city of Ravenna, but that was as far as they could get. They were never able to completely reestablish the Roman Empire that we knew and love from the classical period. Now, of course, during this time, you have Muslim expansions and Muslim conquests going into Europe, and the Byzantines were kind of sort of the the border, the sort of guard against the Muslim expansion into Europe, at least from the eastern part. And they were largely successful. And it's kind of an interesting uh, way that they were able to do it. Their defense was made possible um, through technology, through the use of Greek fire. Ooh, yeah, that was a fire noise. That's why I was thinking flames earlier. But yeah, here's an old image of Greek fire. And essentially it was a the reason we call it Greek fire is it was special than normal fire in that it could keep the water aflame. Now, I'm not going to get into the science and chemistry of it, mostly because I don't know how it works. Um, but just rest assured, they were able to sort of projectile shoot fire from ships and essentially set Muslim ships aflame and completely ruin any sort of amphibious assault or any sort of um, continuation of uh, supply chains to the Muslim army. And the Muslims were just not able to continue into Constantinople. And that stopped their expansion into Europe from that direction. Imagine if they did take Constantinople and were able to continue to push um, westward into into Europe. It'd be a very different Europe. But remember, during this time, the Muslims are expanding everywhere. The Byzantines were able to push them away, basically at Constantinople, the sort of hinge point from where East meets West, from where Asia meets Europe. And Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, was able to control its fairly sizable territory through a theme system. Themes are what they called provinces. Um, and it's basically just like the satrapies that we saw in the Persian Empire. It's very similar to states that we have today. They're under the control of generals, and it's sort of a very top-down military administration. Um, um, soldiers from the peasant class could be rewarded with land grants, and that's what really got people to buy into this. If I work with the government, if I do what the government tells me, if I serve the emperor of the of the Roman slash Byzantine Empire, I might get some land. And this inclusion is very, very important. This is what makes nation states succeed. If people believe if they support the system and they'll be rewarded for it, guess what? The political system works. And it certainly worked here. When people stop believing that, then the system falls apart. And that's essentially what happened to the Byzantine Empire. Um, people stopped getting rewarded. There was rampant corruption and that ended it. And we'll see that happen again and again in many any other nation states. <coughs> Sorry for my cough. Now, moving over to the West, we see the rise of a group of people called the Franks, basically the ancestors of the French. Um, the last Roman emperor uh, was deposed by a Germanic tribal leader named Odoacer. Um, and from that, we still have an administrative apparatus still in place to a degree, but cities just lost population. People left. There just wasn't enough of a good food supply to sustain a population that was doing things other than making food. So you really couldn't have as many artisans. You couldn't have as many merchants. You couldn't really have as many people doing anything apart from making food. And there were certain German accessor states to a degree, but they weren't able able to really keep a true administrative state for very long, if at all. And we see those um, in the Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Lombards, and Franks. The Franks um, 
were one of the key pieces of European development that we see. Um, they are kind of one of the three pieces of what would be European development. We see remnants of the Roman Empire. We see these sort of Germanic type tribal cultural influences and we also see Christianity those are kind of the three pieces that we see and these Germanic Frankish people would convert to Christianity to gain popular support because remember Christianity was the official religion of the Roman Empire and it did spread to a very very wide degree before the Western Roman Empire fell apart and even though the Roman Empire fell apart the Christian Church in Rome did not. That continued on. And we see a Carolingian dynasty, basically a family start to rule the Frankish kingdoms, beginning with a guy by the name of Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer. And the reason we called him the Hammer is because he was a very, very, very good warrior. His most notable victory is undoubtedly the victory of uh, Tours, the battle at Tours, in which armies led by Charles the Hammer. Look at him hammering away at Turkish or at Spanish Muslims um, enabled Europe to stay Christian. Basically, Muslims had swept through Northern Africa, swept through Spain, and would have swept through France and perhaps the rest of Europe as well. But Charles the Hammer said, not in my dojo, and swept them away. Um, very, very famous battle. A lot of epic poems were made from it. Um, one of the most notable ones was the La Chanson de Roland, or the Song of Roland, in which basically French armies are trying to fight back against um, Spanish Muslims. At one point in the story, the title character, Roland, um, has to go back and make sure that they're not getting pursued, and he does see the Spanish pursuing them. I'm paraphrasing probably pretty badly, but the coolest part is he blows a horn to warn the other Frenchmen. Um, he blows it so hard that his... his, his like head kind of explode, just burn, boom, head blows up. So pretty wild. Those epic poems are no shortage of violence, though they're kind of hard to follow and oftentimes very boring. But it halted the Islamic advance into Western Europe and kept Europe Christian, at least for for a while. Some would contend today that it's it's advancing into Europe, but um, that's a whole other issue in and of itself. And then we get to Charlemagne, which is literally French for Charles the Great. So if you know anybody named Charles or even Carlos, you can call him Charlemagne and it'll make sense. And they probably won't know what you mean, but it's still fun. Um, but he was the grandson of Charles Martel and he is the main guy of the Carolingian Empire. Um, he expands the territories of um, the Carolingian Empire and really solidifies the imperial rule of the Carolingian Empire, all while being pretty much illiterate. Man could not read a thing. If you wrote some stuff down and you put it under Charlemagne, he'd be like, oh, what does this mean? I am French and I do not know how to read. <laughs> Probably didn't talk like that, but you know, you can imagine. But anyway, um, just like his grandfather, great military leader, just a courageous fighter by all accounts, just one of those guys who could just really, really, really swing a sword and just sort of impose his will on the battlefield, but could not read. But a big important thing is that he converted to Christianity um, and made his empire a Christian one. And he put his capital at Aachen, which is now in today Germany. And he was very similar to King Harsha of India in that he would just travel all over his empire all the time. That was basically his messenger system was him. He just traveled everywhere. And he also developed a system of imperial officials called Missi Dominici, which is Latin for envoys of the Lord Ruler. And he was just always on the move, always traveling, always just sort of monitoring his kingdom. And he expanded his kingdom to a pretty large degree, um, basically expanding pretty far into what is now Italy, what is now Switzerland, and what is now Germany. You can throw in Liechtenstein too if you, if you want to get really, really, really specific. Um, but eventually, he kind of gets almost too big to his for his britches, despite his best attempts. He did not want to challenge the Byzantine emperor. He did not want to basically be seen as emperor and basically cause a stir with the Byzantine empire for good reason. The Byzantine empire was still much more powerful than the Frankish Carolingian empire. And there was a lot more 
benefit to being friends with the Byzantines than being emperors. They still had a lot of money. They still had great trade opportunities if you were nice to them. Um, but he still took that title of emperor. Um, power is a heck of a drug. Okay, And he was crowned emperor by Pope Leo III, which supposedly was a surprise to uh, Charlemagne. Um, some would contend that it wasn't. That's kind of a little history debate, but it was seen as a challenge to Byzantium, but nothing really came of it, and there was no grand conflict between West versus East, at least not until the Crusades arrive. <coughs> and there's another image of the Carolingian Empire, but eventually it falls apart, mostly because the successors of Charlemagne proved to be far less capable than Charlemagne was. They lost control of the courts, lost control of local authorities, they were erupted into a civil war, the empire got divided, and the empire was no longer able to protect itself, and it fell apart in 843. There's Louis the Pious. Apparently he was pious. Good for him. And this brings in the age of the Vikings. <clears throat> they were one of these major external pressures on the Carolingian Empire. Um, from the south, you still had the Muslims coming in and causing problems. From the east, you had a group of people called the Magyars. From the north, you had a group of people obviously known as the Vikings. They are the ones who are the most famous today. Um, the reason people from Scandinavia, so places like modern day Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, even Iceland to a degree, and Finland, the reason they ventured out of their happy icy homes up north was basically they gained large populations, but um, populations up there like anywhere else, they fall victim to cold winters, bad harvest, and they had to go get more food for their people. And also there was just a desire to sort of gain more wealth. They knew that they heard stories about gold from places like Byzantium and the Roman Empire, and they wanted to get it. And they were very, very good sailors, and they were very, very good at just sort of attacking quickly and leaving. But don't think of Vikings as just simply bloodthirsty psychopaths like they're usually presented in most popular culture and also that crappy football team from Minneapolis. Um, they were actually shrewd merchants and they would settle in a lot of these places that supposedly they just simply destroyed and pillaged and raped and whatever awful things you can think of. Um, but we call them Vikings because basically there was like, some of them from the village of Vike Norway and they called them Vikings and just people from that village eventually that name just started to apply from everybody who was from Scandinavia and so that one village just sort of became the descriptor for everybody. Not all of them were from Vike but that's just kind of what they called them. It'd be like if one person from Illinois went and conquered a uh, faraway land and that person uh, happened to be from I don't know from uh, Zion, and every person from Illinois thereafter was called a Zionian, even though everybody is not from Zion. So similar thing to that. But anyway, um, their ability to travel by sea was their biggest advantage. They could travel quickly and they could travel in a lot of tight places. Um, their boats had shallow drafts, which means they didn't go deep into the water, which means they could travel on rivers as well as the oceans. And they would attack places that were very vulnerable, like monasteries, which is where like religious people live who aren't good at fighting at all. And they would just basically arrive, run onto the shore, attack and take whatever they wanted, and then leave. They attacked Constantinople three times um, and took a whole bunch of stuff. So they moved quickly. And the Carolingians had no navy at all. So basically the, the Vikings were able to arrive and attack quickly without really them being able to do any anything about it, them being the Carolingians. <clears throat> and the Carolingian Empire falls apart, not only due to poor administration, but poor administration in the face of a lot of invaders. You had Magyars from the central part of Eastern Europe coming from um, the eastern part, if you're, if you're looking at the perspective of the Carolingians. You have Muslims coming from the south, and you have Vikings coming from just about every direction, except for the the west, or sorry, east rather, again, from the perspective of the Carolingians. <clears throat> 
And here we see two different economies really start to emerge in early medieval Europe from like about 500 to roughly 10 to 1200 ish in Byzantium, still an economic powerhouse. They are able to create more agricultural products than they know what to do with, which enables them to have a lot of specialized jobs like merchants, like artisans and make a lot of stuff that people would want to buy from faraway places. Um, people from Byzantium are able to trade with the Islamic Empire, with the various kingdoms in India, and with the Chinese way, way, way over in obviously China. Western Christendom, not so much. They get invaded so much and they have such crappy organization in terms of their government that their agriculture declines and they're not able to stay stable enough to really be able to make these fine artis artisanal things that allows them to maintain their relationship within um, trans-regional trade. They're not really, no, they're no longer really a hub on the Silk Roads and they really don't have much of a role within that. Um, Byzantine Empire, yes, but Western Europe places like France or modern or people who lived in whereas modern day France and Germany and Spain were no longer really a part of it. Same thing with people that lived in Italy. But in the Byzantine part, the Eastern part, um, the free peasantry kept the Byzantine empire what it was. Again, you had the theme system and this idea that if I work within the system, I could get a land grant and have my own land and be able to make money from it. Who knows, maybe be able to buy more pieces of land and be able to tax people. And that kind of is what their undoing was. You had too many people who were able to buy too many pieces of estate. And basically, if you were a small landowner, you could not compete with these large estates and you got gobbled up. And when that happens and people start saying, there's no point, I can't compete. Why should I participate in this anymore? It falls apart. And Byzantine trade was a huge piece of it. Remember, the Byzantine Empire has a great location. It's closely located to the Islamic Empire, to Northern Africa, to what is there is some trade going on in northern europe thanks mostly to the vikings and they have a good position along the silk road so that they can get the goods that were created in china and india as well as the islamic empire that i'd mentioned earlier they come up with a currency system um, the Byzant becomes their currency so basically a, a a means of trade a means of commerce and they are able to just make a ton of money from the revived and sustained silk roads um, that were maintained throughout this whole time. Remember, traders love stable governments because stable governments allow people to make things, and when things are made, things get traded. Whereas manufacturing and trade in Western Europe was pretty weak um, due to all the political turmoil, not enough food was made to really allow people to engage in commerce or to engage in non-agriculturally based occupations. However, they did have some agricultural innovations. They created a heavy plow, which allowed them to grow more food, and they were able to create water mills, which allowed certain mechanized products to be made basically a giant wheel turns due to a river and it can do things like grind grain to make bread which means animals don't have to do it anymore people don't have to do it anymore which means they can do other things like make art or make you know finely crafted tools and that sort of thing and they made a specialized horse collar so now horses could pull plows and that sort of thing as opposed to just oxen and so we start to see a small scale exchange start to sustain itself and maybe begin to grow as the early uh, Middle Ages continue. And one of the big pushers of merchant activity were actually the Vikings. Um, as much as people love to call them just bloodthirsty savages, they were pretty capable merchants as well. Um, sometimes just taking stuff from people is not always the best way to get rich because sometimes they fight back and kill you. If you can trade with them, it's a lot safer and a lot more sustainable. And a lot of them were able to do that, especially making their way through various um, modern day Russian rivers into what is now the Abbasid Caliphate and also made their way into the Byzantine Empire and conduct trade with them. One of the biggest things they were able to trade were furs. <coughs> furs from various woodland animals that live up there like beavers. Beaver furs were hugely popular um, in areas within the Byzantine and the Islamic Empire, and that would actually grow. Um, and another popular item would be timber, so like 
wood used to make all sorts of different tools and things like that. Byzantium was still, though, a very much an urban society in parts. Most people still worked in agriculture, but they were able to sustain large cities. The aristocrats lived in huge palaces within the cities with just all sorts of lavish and completely opulent sort of living conditions. There is the the emperor of um, Byzantium was described as having a fountain made of gold that shot out wine. So just ridiculous things like that. Um, your artisanal people generally lived in apartments that were above the places where they either sold stuff or their workshop. So if you had like a blacksmith, he probably lived above the place where he did his business. And the poor lived in sort of communal living space, kind of like apartments, but an apartment where you have to share a bathroom and you have to share a kitchen and that sort of thing. But they weren't without their attractions. Um, they had Turkish baths where people got together and literally bathed, kind of like a swimming pool, except a little bit more risque. They also had taverns. Um, obviously where people went to have a drink, a libation. They had restaurants where people obviously dined, and they had theaters. And again, those theaters, all these places were kind of seen as sort of sinful places. And they also had a cool place known as the Hippodrome. There weren't any hippos there, but you got to remember in Greek, hippo means horse. And so there were a lot of like horse races there, chariot races, that sort of thing. It was kind of very similar to like a gladiator type place, like uh, like you saw in the Colosseum in Rome, but not necessarily as many people just slaughtering each other. Much more in the way of like chariot races. Um, it was more of a racetrack. There's a picture of what we think the Hippodrome probably looked like. There's a lot of remnants of it to this day, um, but that's probably what it looked like. But yeah, this is probably where they raced around and that sort of thing. And we're going to take a little break here, so if you want to get a snack, that's fine. And then we'll start part two in a second. Thanks, guys.